I would like to start this video by making a slightly counterintuitive claim that might surprise you when you first hear it. And that is that, in practice, accuracy barely matters. And it's kind of important that we keep remembering this, especially if you are in industry. And let me explain what I mean by this by sketching out a somewhat exaggerated scenario. Let's say over here, this is a data person. And this is kind of the archetype of the type of person that has to do stuff with algorithms and data to build machine learning pipelines that do something good, probably for a company. If this person did a good job, this person could say things like, hey, we have something that is in production. And with that, I mean to imply that it's pretty stable and that users experience a better service or better yet, maybe there's some sort of a cost reduction or even a profit. I'm being overly optimistic here. I'm really assuming the best case scenario, this data person really did a great job. Now in this scenario, how odd would it be if some sort of a CEO were to look at the situation and go, well, I don't know. Has anyone checked the F1 score? Now I'm definitely characterizing here and this is obviously something that shouldn't happen in reality, but you could rightly wonder if in the end we really care more about this sort of a thing, then how bad could it be to focus on F1 scores and standard metrics in machine learning? The point in this video isn't necessarily to say that these scores are bad. It definitely can be helpful to have a couple of these metrics around that are perhaps a bit formal and old school, but they do make the situation just a bit more tangible. But what I do want to show in this video is that if you care more about this sort of a thing, then you should really invest in making your own custom metric because things that you might gain in accuracy you might lose in other aspects that you're probably more interested in. I've set up a little benchmark over here that really helps explain the point that I'm interested in making. It is a benchmark on a demo data set. I have a bunch of these attributes, 20 of them to be exact. These are all in my uh, X variable over here. And I also have something that I'm interested in predicting. And this is a, a binary classification task. If I were to scroll down a little bit over here and if I were to count the labels, then you can see that there is a slight class imbalance, but not a huge one. And for this particular data set, it helps to know that the number one over here indicates a positive label and the number two over here indicates a negative label. So there's slightly more positive labels than negative labels. And then from there, I can do my train test splitting. So I can have my uh, X train, my X test, Y train, Y test, all that good stuff. But what do you do at this point in time? We are dealing with a classification use case. So your first gut response might be, well, let's do stuff with accuracy, maybe check precision and recall and that sort of thing. And although that's not necessarily a bad thing to investigate, you could also wonder, well, what is the business case? And for that, you kind of have to understand the story that is behind this data set. This data set in particular is about German credit scores. And depending on all of these attributes, we might be able to say something about how good or bad your credit is. And then you can imagine that there are just two kinds of mistakes that we make. We can have a false positive or we can have a false negative. If I were to think about accuracy, then both of these two would be equal in their performance. Accuracy really says a false positive is as bad as a false negative. But in reality, you might actually have a fairly different cost assigned to either of these outcomes. And if that's the case, it certainly feels appropriate to capture that in some sort of a metric. And then probably we are also interested in optimizing towards a cost like this. Another big benefit of doing this, by the way, is that typically this is a lot easier to explain to business stakeholders. Things like precision and recall require a bit of mathematical context. But if you can put a monetary amount on something, that's usually also a good thing. And so I've defined a custom business metric below over here that implements just that. I have my actual values and my predicted values. And I also have a negative and positive label that I'm passing along. This is important for this data set because I'm not dealing with ones and zeros. But from here, I am effectively just calculating the confusion matrix as one might normally. And then this two by two matrix is going to be multiplied by this two by two array. And for false positives, you can attach a number. And for false negatives, you can attach another one. I'm just taking minus one and minus two in this case. You should probably do more of an effort to figure out what actual monetary values might be appropriate here. But this is a fairly simple business metric function that you can use to go a bit beyond what accuracy is doing and by actually assigning some sort of a cost 
to the outcome of a bad prediction. Then below over here, what we're doing is we're just multiplying the confusion matrix with this gain matrix. Any item on this diagonal over here will be correctly predicted. So we're not going to associate any cost for that, but we are going to punish these off diagonal elements. Note that in theory, you could also go a step further. I am saying, hey, there's a cost when we make a mistake, but you might also be able to quantify some sort of a benefit. It could be the case that predicting something correctly maybe brings in a monetary amount. And if that's the case, then maybe that's something you want to incorporate as well. There's some flexibility here that you should totally use if it's appropriate. So after I've defined this metric, I am then going to proceed with a dictionary that contains all sorts of metrics that I might be interested in tracking. And in this demo, I'm going to be using precision, recall, and accuracy because they're quite common. But I'm also going to add my business metric down below over here. Note that these are all metric functions and we have to turn them into proper scores for scikit-learn to be able to use them in a grid search. But the main thing that's kind of nice is that I've got this one dictionary that defines all the scoring that I would like to apply. And this dictionary over here is used in a grid search down below over here. I've constructed a pipeline that's using a histogram boosted classifier. I also put a table vectorizer in front of it. So nothing too fancy, but this is a sensible default to get started with. And I've also got a parameter grid over here. And you can see that I'm trying out different values for the learning rate of this algorithm. Just a few values, nothing fancy. Now that we've got our scores as well as our grid search, we can now try to answer the question, well, which hyperparameter do we like the most? And this is where we're going to see something that is indeed quite interesting. So just for good measure, I have a CV variable over here that contains this grid search. This object represents something that has indeed been trained. So we've called dot fit on it. The HTML widget that you see over here also confirms all of this. But this object also has some CV results attached. And what I'm doing below over here is I'm looping over all the items in those results. It's just that I'm only going to be looking at a subset. I'm just interested in the seeing the learning rate as well as some mean test scores. And here's what that final table would then look like. I've got these three different learning rates, as I said before. We should remember that as far as metrics go, higher is usually better. But we are dealing with negative numbers here because we're talking about costs, not benefits. And overall, this is the lowest negative number. So if we are interested in our business metric, then you could argue that this is the score that we would totally prefer. Now, let's contrast that to all those other metrics. I guess you could say for recall, you come to the same conclusion. But for accuracy and precision, you would pick a different one. This table over here sketches a picture, and we should remember that the picture that it sketches isn't necessarily general. In this particular case, we see that the business metric doesn't coincide with the standard machine learning metrics that we've listed over here. For a lot of scenarios, you can imagine that having a more accurate model would also correlate with a good business metric. That could totally happen, but it's not always the case. And that is the point I'm trying to make in this video. If you're able to quantify a business outcome to a machine learning model, there might still be really good reasons to track lots of other useful metrics because I might help you understand and debug the pipeline. But especially if you're trying to communicate to stakeholders and especially if you are interested in making a meaningful impact, then I wouldn't want to overfit on standard metrics and I might strongly recommend you to think about adding your own as well. After all, odds are that the users and the CEOs of this world are really going to prefer this over these other metrics over here.